Western Rim Europe due to the high spread of the Delta variant, which should remain the main focus of public health actions to cope with the pandemic and its consequences. We are in the midst of a full wave, and the combination of high vaccination rates and preventative measures is the only way to curb it. Vaccines are and will continue to be the cornerstone of our response to the pandemic. We need to get the highest possible number of EU citizens vaccinated. Therefore, we would like to reiterate a call to all to complete their primary vaccination series and for those who are eligible to get a booster shot. Moving on to Omicron, this variant, which is classified as a variant of concern by the WHO, has been already detected in several European countries. Preliminary data suggests that it may be more transmissible than the Delta variant, but is currently unclear to what extent Omicron may be replacing Delta as the dominant virus. Of note, today, cases appear to be mostly mild. However, we need to gather more evidence to determine whether the spectrum of disease severity caused by Omicron is different from that of all the variants that have been circulating so far. Only time will tell. Preliminary data on the ability of syrup from vaccinated or previously infected individuals to cross-neutralize the Omicron variant are showing, not unexpectedly, that there is a considerable reduction in the neutralization compared to ancestral or Delta strains. However, data are still preliminary, and we need to gather a more precise picture around the level of immunity that can be retained following different types of vaccination and or following natural exposure to the virus. At this stage, we do not have enough data on the impact of this variant on the effectiveness of the approved vaccine, but we are continuously scanning the horizon to gather evidence in this regard. In any case, we are preparing to take rapid action should the need arise. The companies that market COVID-19 vaccines are required to submit the results of their laboratory tests to determine the level of neutralization for Omicron and discuss the possible options with us. EMA, as you know, has already been working with the vaccine manufacturers on contingency plans for new variants to define the requirements for advancing potential variant vaccines. We are also in close contact with international regulators and the WHO to that effect. However, let me stress again that it's too early to say whether the vaccine composition will need to be changed. And again, time will tell. We should not lose sight of the fact that today we have better tools to prevent and treat this disease than we had last winter, and this is a very important remark from our side. Recently, we have assessed evidence on the mix-and-match approaches for COVID-19 vaccine. That is when two different COVID-19 vaccines are used, either in the primary vaccination series or for boosting, three or six months after the completion of the primary series. The review of the available evidence was conducted by experts from the European CDC and the EMA COVID Task Force, the ETF, composed by experts from EU Medicine National Regulators and the EMA. The study showed that the combination of viral vector vaccine followed by messenger RNA vaccine produces high level of antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 virus when used either as primary vaccination or as booster. In addition, this approach elicits even higher level of T cells, which are the white blood cells produced by the body immune system to fight off the infection, compared to primary homologous vaccination, which is when two doses of the same vaccines are used. In addition, the emerging effectiveness data, they show an increased protection from symptomatic disease after retrologous boosting with a messenger RNA vaccine during spread of the Delta variant. And these are important data that corroborate the conclusion on the immunogenicity. While the current recommendation is to administer booster preferably after six months, the data currently available support safe and effective administration of a booster as early as three months from completion of the primary vaccination should such a short interval be desirable from a public health perspective. Heterologous vaccination and boosting are both tools that could offer flexibility to the member states, particularly in cases where the availability of certain type of vaccines may be limited, and our considerations are intended to help decision makers at national level. 
I would now like to quickly touch upon vaccination for children. As you know, two weeks ago, the CHMP, which is uh, the EMA Scientific Committee for Human Medicinal Products, recommended to extend the use of Comirnaty, which is the vaccine from Pfizer-BioNTech, to children from 5 to 11 years of age. This vaccine is administered in this age group at a lower dose than for adults, so is one-third of the adult dose, as two injections three weeks apart. This approval relies on data from a main study which initially included 2,000 participants and was later expanded to more than 3,000 children vaccinated with Comirnaty. The study demonstrated that the immune response in the 5 to 11 years old is comparable to the one elicited in adults. It also collected data on protection from COVID with preliminary high efficacy shown in line with what expected and seen in adults. The safety data are overall reassuring and have to be seen in conjunction with the extended evidence available in adolescents and adults, which is supportive of the safety of this vaccine. So far, no safety concern have emerged from the large vaccination campaign in the 5 to 11 years group that is taking place in the United States. Pediatric trials for COVID-19 vaccine follow an investigation plan that was agreed beforehand with the manufacturers. A vaccine is studied first in adolescents and then progressively in children below 12 years of age down to the youngest ages. This approach ensures that knowledge on the safety and efficacy is built up carefully before the vaccines are considered for younger age groups. Epidemiological data, they show that infections and hospitalization of children aged 5 to 11 years have been seen on the rise in recent months. While children at risk of severe COVID should be given the priority, all children in this age bracket should be considered for vaccination. Children without comorbidities are also affected by COVID and can suffer from the harmful effect of this virus, be hospitalized or admitted to intensive care. In addition, there are conditions such as the multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children that are associated with the SARS-CoV-2 infection and should not be understated in terms of the burden of disease they carry. Vaccination is key to prevent COVID and the constellation of medical conditions associated with this virus in children. The safety of the COVID-19 vaccine continues to be demonstrated and is supported by their large-scale use worldwide. This is the largest vaccination campaign ever. And uh, in Europe, and only is focusing on Europe, more than 600 million doses have been administered so far. The scale of the ongoing global vaccination campaigns means that we have already more information for COVID-19 vaccine safety than we did for many other vaccines. And the safety profile of the COVID-19 vaccine is very reassuring as their side effects are generally mild. As you know, currently we have four authorized vaccines in the EU. We hope we'll be in the position to add a fifth one to the European portfolio before the end of the year, when the CHMP could possibly conclude on the evaluation of the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine called Novavax-Covid. This vaccine is based on a different platform technology than those currently authorized. It contains the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus together with an adjuvant, which is a substance that helps strengthen the immune response. When authorized, this vaccine will provide a new option for vaccinating people in the EU and globally. Looking at treatments now, the CHMP has recommended extending the indication of Roctemra, which is based on the monoclonal antibodies tocilizumab, to include the treatment of hospitalized adults with COVID-19 who are receiving treatment with corticosteroids and require extra oxygen or mechanical ventilation. Roctemra is already authorizing the EU to treat other conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis. The CHMP reviewed the data from a study conducted in more than 4,000 hospitalized patients that showed that rock temra, one given by infusion to patients who were receiving systemic treatment with corticosteroids at the same time, led to fewer deaths in comparison to systemic steroids alone. This medicine, a monoclonal antibody that acts by modulating the immune system response to inflammation, has another important option for the treatment of patients that are already at an advanced stage of disease and for which we have limited therapeutic options at the moment. 
COVID-19 is an insidious disease with different manifestations that require different treatment at different stages. While we have no magic bullet against it, we have an increasing ample array at our disposal now. And the MA is progressing in the evaluation of other therapeutics as well, from the monoclonal antibodies to oral antivirals that will hopefully expand even further the range of treatments that are available in the EU. Molnupiravir and Paxlovid are under assessment as we speak. A recommendation to support emergency use for Paxlovid, similarly to Molnupiravir, is expected to take place before the end of this year. The emerging data from Molnupiravir, pointing to lower efficacy than initially seen, will be carefully reviewed before any opinion for marketing authorization can be granted. Xevudiden, which is a product based on the monoclonal neutralizing antibody Sotrovimab, will be considered for approval by the CHMP next week for the treatment of patients with COVID-19 that do not require, uh, that do, uh, require, uh, do not require sorry, additional oxygen and who are at increased risk of disease progression. This approval would then expand the range of antiviral monoclonal antibodies that we have at disposal and can extend the ability to have antibodies that can retain efficacy against variants of concern that are and will be emerging in the future. I will stop here, but before I give the floor back to our moderator, I want to stress for one final time the importance of vaccination while this wave fueled by the Delta variant is ongoing. Whether it is the primary vaccination or the booster dose, it is crucial for people to get protected as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cavalieri. And we are now taking questions from the floor. So, dear colleagues from the media, please remember to turn on your camera when you want to ask a question, and please click on the respective icon at the bottom of the WebEx window to raise your hand. When I give you the floor, we will unmute you, and you can ask your question once your microphone has been enabled. The first question is from Helen Collis from Politico. Helen, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions um, based on the data that came out yesterday um, around vaccine efficacy with, uh, against Omicron. Um, the chief executive of BioNTech yesterday said it was clear that for Omicron, their vaccine should be a three-dose regimen. Um, with the current rates of infection with Omicron doubling every two to three days, models predict this will be the dominant variant by Christmas in countries like the UK and possibly Denmark and others. Um, where does this leave the EMA um, guidance on the use of this um, vaccine and other vaccines currently? Um, is the EMA reviewing the marketing authorization indication in light of Omicron? Um, and secondly, um, BioNTech said that um, Omicron targeted vaccine could be available by March next year, depending on regulatory authorization. How quickly could the EMA authorize a new vaccine um, based on existing, existing expedited processes? Thank you. Thank you very much. Both questions are for Dr. Cavalleri. Marco, please. Yeah, indeed, this is a very important area of work for us right now. And uh, what we will need to do is, first of all, to collect all the evidence that we have around all these studies conducted in the lab. And you have seen that are not really showing the same level of decrease in the cross neutralization. So it will be important, you know, to consolidate the data, to have a clear picture around what is happening and to what extent we are losing uh, neutralization from uh, vaccinated people. Uh, and this will have to be read in conjunction with what is happening indeed with epidemiology, whether Omicron will be spreading as it looks to be doing, but of course we don't know yet if it will replace uh, Delta by Christmas. It can happen but we are not certain about that, and also to look into uh, real-world evidence to really understand uh, if the effectiveness of the vaccines uh, is dramatically reduced or not. This we don't know yet, and we need to collect all this information. But at the same time, we will be talking to the manufacturers to look, first of all, what is the plan for the development of a potential Omicron variant vaccine, which we think uh, anyway uh, work should be conducted in any case, whether this will become dominant or not, is important that we move ahead with a clear-cut plan around how to develop this type of vaccine, and at the same time to look into contingency plan to see whether indeed booster doses will be able to take care of the Omicron to uh, a level that will indeed uh, reduce the burden of disease that might be associated with this variant. And 
and uh, all options will be on the table. So we will be looking at all of them and we will be discussing with the manufacturers in due course. With respect to the timing of an approval of an Omicron variant vaccine, we already stated that this can happen very fast. We put out the minimum requirement in terms of manufacturing and also clinical data that we may want to see before we give an approval. And we will be looking forward discussing with the developers, but also with international regulators, how this uh, clinical package will look like and what will be the minimum requirement for the manufacturing. But we expect that indeed, in a matter of uh, three to four months, we will be in the position of approving a variant vaccine for Omicron. Thank you very much. The next question is from Denise Rowland from the Wall Street Journal. Denise. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, it's a follow-on question, really, and it's about what clinical data you would need to see to approve a variant vaccine. I assume a variant vaccine would need to prove in some way that it gives a bigger boost to um, neutralising antibodies against the Omicron variant and not just an equivalent boost to the original vaccines. Is that right? The question on, uh, you know, whether, what kind of data we need. Uh, Marco Cavalieri, please. Yeah, this will be discussed uh, with the companies in due course, but uh, if you have seen our reflection paper that was published at the beginning of this year, we clearly state that as a minimum, we would like to see that the neutralization of the new variant vaccine against the variant, so in this case, Omicron, will be to the same level of the neutralization seen with the original vaccine that demonstrated clinical efficacy in terms of neutralizing antibody. So that would be the minimum requirement. Now we got boosters that have been approved in the meanwhile, so we will have to put this in context and to understand what uh, might be the best design that we can look at in terms of assessing what is the level of uh, neutralization elicited by uh, this new variant vaccine. So it's, it's a bit premature really to pin down exactly how this requirement will look like. Thank you very much. I now take a question from Christina Hudenko from Delphi. This is a Latvian online medium. Christina, please. Uh, maybe you partly answered on these questions, but my question is, what is the probability that in uh, 2022 the, there will be a need for a fourth or five or fifth booster vaccine against COVID-19 that will be more effective for Omicron or maybe next variant? Dr. Cavalieri? Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have a crystal ball and we cannot anticipate what the future will bring. But I think it will be important that before any decision is taken on the changes of the composition of the current vaccines, we take, in, we take into account what else is emerging or what else might be emerging. Because indeed, we don't want to be in the position that we change the composition to an Omicron vaccine. And then it turns out that a new variant comes up that is, uh, looks a bit uh, closer than the Delta or the previous variants. So this is a dilemma that will have to be discussed when time will come to decide whether the composition of the vaccines will have to be changed. And I cannot exclude that we'll also be in the position to discuss even multivalent vaccines, so vaccines that will contain more than one strain of SARS-CoV-2. Thank you very much. I do not see any additional questions. So if there are no more raised hands, I would like to close today's press conference and uh, thank all the participants. Big thank you also to my colleagues here on the panel. And uh, please note that our next and actually last press briefing for 2021, at least our last regular press briefing, will take place on Tuesday, 21st December. And if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate, as always, to follow up with the press office at press at ema.europa.eu. Thank you very much and have a nice rest of the day. Bye-bye.